Hello, everyone. My name is Rich Martin, uh, Director of Technical Marketing, and I know that might scare you. Trust me, there's not 100 slides by a marketing person. I actually have a pretty deep network engineering background, so I am demoing, and maybe that's a little scary, but uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how to integrate network automations with your IT ecosystem using the iTential platform for both NetOps and DevOps teams. Uh, and so as Chris mentioned earlier, the, the uh, integration capabilities is where we're going to start here. It's because it's foundational. Um, we first start with API integration. So all of the ecosystem now that has APIs available um, for automation, we want to make it super simple for both NetOps, NetOps teams who are looking at how do we inter integrate our data center controller, our SD-WAN orchestrators and controllers, as well as how do we automate our IT systems, IPAMs, ITSMs, things like that. API uh, integration also for the cloud side of it, for the DevOps teams, how do we automate with all of these cloud platforms that have very robust API integrations or APIs available to them, as well as the tooling that they're using, right? GitHub, GitLab, and all kinds of other CI CD tooling. That covers a lot of the API based integrations, but there's this whole slew of stuff that's CLI based integrations or have no APIs available to them. So, Chris mentioned this earlier. There's a whole slew of NetOps teams that are using scripts. Ansible, Python, um, we want to be able to take that and incorporate it into our platform um, so that it can be used and normalized uh, on, on our platform so that it can continue to be used. Uh, similarly, on the DevOps side, you have Terraform, uh, CloudFormation, Azure DevOps, so they have an, an entire set of tooling that uh, can also be leveraged inside the platform. And finally, once we have all of these integrations done, uh, we, want to, we want to expose them on our low-code canvas as drag-and-drop workflow tasks, normalizing whether it's an API call, whether it's a, it's a script now that we've attached an API to. It's all normalized on the canvas so that you can start building using these integrations. I have a question sure. on, the, on the device side. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier that um, for API integration, you're, you're doing an import from people that are supporting Swagger, but what about hardware platforms that do have a full API to them on NetConf or, or whatever, but they're, they're not uh, visible in, in a, as simply as importing a swagger. Is, is there a way? So is there a, if there's a, yeah, if there's a published API that yeah. they have, um, you could leverage something like Postman to create a collection, save it as a JSON, and then import it into the system. Uh, they can be, you know, the, the API, we use a, open API spec, you can also hand roll a JSON to follow an API spec, the open API spec, uh, you know, one at a time. Ideally, vendors should be publishing standards, and we hope that continues. We've seen a, a large amount of vendors continue to do that. We hope to see that more in the future as well. Yeah, I'd like to see more of the publication going on, but some yeah. of these things have been around for decades now, so they don't have that. Correct, <laughs> correct, yeah, ability. yeah. But if it has an API, we support all kinds of legacy APIs as well. You know, so um, th those things can be done. But ideally, we want you know to be able to. So in order for uh, customers to automatically generate integrations, right, yeah. so that they can move very fast as their ecosystem changes or an API changes, um, ideally that's where we see things heading. And so where we'll spend some time, at least in this demonstration, uh, in our platform is, is doing the integrations. I want to show you how to leverage some existing integrations that we, we have since we've been in business and helped customers. We've created a library of, of integrations and adapters and automations. So I'll show you how to leverage that, show you how to do a, uh, a, an integration using an open API spec, and then I'll show you how we accomplish onboarding all of your, your scripts and things like that, attaching basically an API to them, and then leveraging them on our platform. So with that, let's uh, go to the demo. Okay, so we're in the iTential platform, and this section of the platform is called Admin Essentials. Uh, this is where we can onboard um, anything in our pre-built collection. So if I go here, I can browse our pre-built collection. This is actually, so our pre-built collection, we have over 300 um, pre-built assets in our, in our collection. It's published on our GitLab site. It's also searchable on our website. And of course, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's searchable and installable from within our platform it's, itself. So we've onboarded quite a bit of, of, of adapters and automations for this particular demonstration we'll be showing you today. But just as an example, like if I was interested in ServiceNow, I might get started saying, hey, how do I do ServiceNow? What do we have available? Uh, I can quickly search 
I can click on what I'm looking at. In this case, it's a it's an example automation that does uh, an, uh, that does a, a an open request on an incident ticket, um, and I can take a look at what's going on here, and I can actually start to leverage and use this. So I can install it, and then it appears in our platform. And I'll show you what we've done already in a moment at the end of this demonstration. So that's one way to leverage all of this uh, existing uh, automation assets in our library. So we we, we want our customers to really get started very very quickly. Um, so again, it, answer, it asks the questions, well, what if you have an adapter for system XYZ, but there's a new API that's been published for it? Do we have to wait on you to generate the new uh, adapter from in your pre-built library to do that? And the answer is, of course, no. One of, our, one of our focuses is allowing us, our customers, to generate those integrations. So I can do that here from Admin Essentials as well. Uh, I can import and create a new integration model, right? And this is where it's going to basically step me through creating a new integration. So we've already onboarded a Panorama um, adapter, but I can create, so imagine if this was a Panorama with a new version of the API, I could take this file, it's, it's a JSON file that's, uh, that's describing the open API for it. Um, I can bring it into the system so it's just read it in. I can validate it since it's, J it's a JSON. So I can ensure that the model is a valid JSON. And then I can just click import. So I've created the, the first stage of the integration. So if we look through here, it's going to tell us all of the APIs that are here and available to be exposed uh, from this particular uh, API file. Uh, once I've seen that, once I've accepted that, I can. the next step is to actually create an instantiation of the integration. So uh, in this case, I can just give it a name. And sorry, how did you add Panorama? Do you already have like pre-built integrations with all these vendors? Uh, so in our pre-built library, we have, like I said, there's over 300 assets. A lot of them, most of them are adapters to all kinds of systems. But in case they, we don't have that, or if in case the version of adapter that we have, you know, maybe a, an older version of the API spec, they've, they've, you know, think about like AWS, how quickly they iterate new services and you know, changes can be made to the AP, underlying API. Being able to grab the file from the vendor and then importing into the system. And so you can have that latest version in, involved without having to be beholden to a vendor to build it for you or hire somebody to uh, create it for you. So if I save this, now it creates an instantiation. And presuming I put in the right URL and authentication credentials, this will actually be available. And I can start to build integrations using all of those APIs that were exposed. So right from the very beginning, on a clean system, you can, you can grab, um, you can grab adapters and integrations and automations from our pre-built library from here, and as well as just start uploading these uh, API documentation files and uh, start building these integrations. So now let me take you over to Automation Gateway. So remember, Automation Gateway is where we can uh, onboard scripts and other kind of command line based uh, automations that every organization has. Um, and so whether using Terraform plans or Python scripts or Ansible playbooks, they're all available here. You can onboard the, them into the system. And really, once they're onboarded, we want to make them available. So you can think of this like, how do we bolt an API onto this to make it accessible through you know, an API call? Because that's what we're trying to do. We want to normalize the script to put an API on it so that it can be used throughout our platform and technically out, externally outside of the platform too. So what we can do is I can take this uh, Python script that we've onboarded. Once it's onboarded in the system and it's discovered, it can be viewed, it can be shared with the, with the rest of the NetOps team, which is very helpful. So a lot of times people don't even understand which scripts people have you know, uh, to understand how, to, how it's being used. Um, but really what we want to do once, in order to like validate that, that the input to that script, think of, if, if we were to run this script on the command line, and this is a, like, this is basically a simple show, right? It's a Git interface. It's going to show me some information about an existing interface. I would have to know on the command line, you know, what is the first arg arg argument value? What's the second? What's the third? We want to define that very specifically and very, uh, uh, very directly, um, because when we when we uh, present this as a as an asset and a workflow task, uh, we want to make sure the inputs are correct to the to the to the script so that uh, it's going to run correctly. And if the inputs don't match, then we shouldn't be running this this script or the, uh, in this task. So that's what we're doing here. I'm just defining a basic JSON schema. Uh, and all I'm really doing is I'm providing, you know, a, I'm saying, hey, give me, 
make sure that we have an interface name that's a type string so that I can pass this into the script. And really, for, for simplicity's sake, that's all I want to do here. So if I save that, you'll see here that this script went from basically a, not having a little blue triangle to a blue triangle, which means it's decorated and it has a valid, uh, a valid attachment for this decoration to it. So that now it has a well-defined API um, uh, payload de definition so that when we call it as an API, we know it's going to ask for an interface, it's got to be a string, and if it doesn't match, we won't call the script, right? So this is, you'll see this is a recurring theme throughout. When you're dealing with APIs, they always have very structured inputs and very structured outputs. And sometimes those inputs and outputs are different, and so you're going to have to do some data manipulation between API calls. But it's important to understand that in this world, API definitions on inputs and outputs. And so that's really what we're doing here is just creating an API definition on the input for this script. Is it also possible to create pre-checks using regex to validate or standardize my interface names? No, absolutely. In fact, uh, in not the next session, but the session after that, you should you, we will show you a whole slew of tools that we can use that include uh, re testing and validating using reg that can use regex. And on more complex scripts, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. this is what you would do if yeah. you just want to invoke an existing script and and use it, right? Correct. But suppose over the years, we've built this more complex workflow-like script. Is is there a tool in here that helps me break that down into its components and uh, tear it apart, or is that going to be a manual process for us? We're, yeah, we're just taking the scripts that have already been built, so it's not you know it's not purposed for that. It's it's that's something that would have to be worked on, you know, by the script originator, the creator. Um, what you can do though because is obviously this is a workflow system. Ultimately, right. I want the work full workflow here, so some of these more complex ones, I'd want to break them down into their unit pieces and, Correct. and Correct. buy them into your workflow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would have to be something done by the programmer to break that out. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right, so let me show you what this looks like normalized. So the first thing I did, well, it wasn't the first thing, but one of the things I did was we kind of normalized that script. Uh, so I can search for it here on the right-hand side. So here is the git interface script that we put an API. Uh, we, we defined it an input through decoration. Now it's available via API, so I can drag it into here. Um, we talked about the uh, panorama. Whoops. We talked about panorama. So I could drag and drop in, no, drag and drop in a panorama task. So that's the script, the panorama task, and then I showed you a little about, about ServiceNow, so we could actually drag in something from ServiceNow, create incident. And now we can start to leverage this. So once everything has been onboarded, all of this is available on the right-hand side for every workflow to be used. Um, so once it's onboarded, every, every workflow can potentially utilize any one of these integrations, any one of the APIs within the integrations. And now you can start building your, uh, your workflow on this, on this canvas. So one of the things I did mention earlier is the fact that there is going to be some data data translation necessary. We want to make we're going to introduce to you to those tools in our platform, so that when we feed input into a shell into this particular script, the output comes out. We may need to extract an IP address from an interface that the script is is pulling, as an example, so that it can be used in this create address for a panorama firewall rule. Uh, and that output maybe needs to be uh, updated in a ServiceNow ticket. And so all the tools in the build session, which comes next, we're going to, we're going to show you how all of that works together and so how you can take these API integrations and start uh, utilizing them to build more complex end-to-end -end workflows. Do you have a, a wizard or existing templates that I can start with for common tasks like that? Um, well, I think probably most of our customers go to our pre-built library and start utilizing what we have already built, but we also have a, a process where we help customers understand the platform and even take them through building very basic to even more than just basic workflows that are actually relevant for your for your your network and IT ecosystem. Right. So we try to enable the customers to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Can I create a template like that to, so that it's? A, a basic workflow template that somebody else would then use and do other things. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the tasks that we have are stub tasks. So you can stub things out, like create a workflow ticket or create a service now ticket, do a pre-check, do a post-check, and then fill those out over time so that, okay, now I'm going to actually put the new task in that does the service now ticket creation, right? So yeah, you can absolutely do that. 
Um, so I, I spotted an ad transcript in there. So I'm curious, uh, <laughs> NFT tends to be very enterprise focused, but ad tran is usually in the service provider space. Is this being used by service providers as well as enterprises? Oh, absolutely. So automation yeah. type? Absolutely. Uh, you know, applications? Y yes. Good eye and yes, this is mo most definitely used by enterprise and service providers. Is it uh, just curious, is this being used to replace like an OSS BSS or is it used to like augment that because that's, you know, the traditional, you know, collection of archaic scripts that we use in service provider that we've, you know, glommed together and called it a, you know, OSS BSS, but I yeah. see a lot of flexibility in this um, to fill that role. Hey, Kevin. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of discussion on OSS BSS. Um, you know, if you look at the traditional OSS stack, like provisioning and activation, that's that that's what you a lot of your, what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, and from a networking stack perspective, we were talking about in my session about going from kind of like traditional devices over. So as the networks become more programmable, that that what I would call legacy OSS stack doesn't really know how to work with that. So a lot of the networking teams are trying to figure out how to take automation and provide a network API into the OSS. So we really see a replatforming of, of OSS and a lot of the enterprise tools. We actually see a, a lot of uh, like similarities with ServiceNow and Salesforce being dominant OSS where it ha traditionally hasn't been there. So it's really the networking teams are using things like Hytential to provide a network API into that OSS. So OSS doesn't have to talk to those devi specific devices like you're talking about with Adtran. So we really see a, a replatforming there. Um, and just one other thing to add on that is the, the network infrastructure that service providers are using is very similar to what we're seeing on the enterprise side. So you're really seeing SD-WAN, data center overlay, especially on the edge side, a lot of consolidation. So it's really the same technologies and the same techniques used across both. So yeah, I, I, I'd also add to that on the service provider side is that a lot of the automations that, that I see our, our teams doing are, yeah, we're feeding into the OSS I got from manufacturer A, but that's only a three quarters or a half of the service and the rest of it's on vendor B and that OSS doesn't talk to vendor B. So our automation is making the API call to the OSS from vendor A, and then going over to the vendor B system and doing it there and stitching the complete service for that person together. And it yeah. sounds like this would fit that bill as well. Yeah. Which we're and now doing last... manually in Python. Sorry. You're also seeing service providers uh, uh, using a lot of technologies that quote unquote, they don't own. So a lot of partnerships with public cloud, which is straight down the fairway with what we're talking about today, and also a lot of SSE services. So whether it's Prisma Access Cloud or Zscale or SD-WAN, you're seeing them resell a lot of those bundles as managed services on top of their existing fiber footprint. So we're really seeing a lot a lot of standardization around that. And, and both sides are using Itential. And it's very interesting when you think of Itential serving up an API and also consuming it from the enterprise side. Um, there's a lot of awesome use cases there. Yeah, and, and also great, using you. the source of truth in that process too, going out to our oh, DNS sure. uh, system and grabbing the IP addresses needed and going over to the right. order system and pulling the circuit ID information and stuff from, from there to actually feed into the circuit creation process, which again, you can't do in just one place. You need to pull from all of these.